At the Detroit Silverdome, the Lions were expected to give the Browns a real pummeling of past form held up, where Cleveland had a string of seven straight losses in the Motor City. In fact, the Browns trailed in the series by a whopping 12-2 margin. Luckily for Cleveland, the two teams don't meet frequently. This is their first get together since 1975. Unluckily for Cleveland, Detroit is coming off a very strong opening day win over Tampa Bay. The Lions' defense was awesome against the Bucks, shutting them out and piling up seven quarterback sacks in the process. The main man of the onslaught was number 79 defensive end William Gay, who totaled five and a half traps. Gay's target across the line will be Brian Seif, who is once again the Browns' starter at quarterback. This year, Cleveland has installed the one-back attack for the first time. But the main strength of this Brown squad lies with its linebackers. Number 52, Dick Ambrose, and number 50, Tom Cousineau, give Cleveland a nice blend of youth and experience in the middle. Cousineau has been playing with more confidence and impact than he displayed in his rookie year. On the outside are Clay Matthews and Chip Banks, number 56, who seems to have taken up where he left off as defensive rookie of the year. But Cleveland's defense can take no bows for its performance against the Vikings opening day. For the bald facts are that they permitted 27 points and nearly as many big plays. A very disappointing defensive debut. Eric Hipple is the man they'll be after today for he has emerged as a lying quarterback with Gary Danielson nipping at his heels. Another factor could be Billy Sims who rushed for only 37 yards in his first game. This game breaker could be ready to explode as the Lions go for a second straight win against the Cleveland squad, which is still looking for its first victory of the new season. It's a continuation of a 30 year and very lopsided rivalry, the Cleveland Browns versus the Detroit Lions. Emily. Where? Duh, on the lips. What's wrong? Penny for your thoughts? What's wrong? You kissed the wrong girl. This is 
is gonna be fun. <laughs> Let's find out how ready you are. In the no-holds-barred world of deep cover espionage, survival in a hostile environment demands you to be the master of many skills. It's no different on the football field. Take this man. Terrell Owens. Intel indicates he's one of the most dangerous receivers in the game. Mastering many of the attributes that makes a good field agent great. Let's go, T.O. Let's go, T.O. He's sophisticated. Able to get the message across. That's a first. Schooled in the delicate art of negotiation. They hate to love me! And of course, a master of disguise. So don't blink or you'll miss the action. On and off the field. And remember this. Hey, we on a mission! Without men like Terrell Owens, it's nothing but a game. Now you're ready for some football. Edie! Hey there, Terrell. What are you doing here? Oh, my house burned down. And I needed to take a long, hot shower. So where are you off to? Looking so pretty. Baby, it's Monday Night Football. Game starts in ten minutes. <laughs> you and your little games. I've got a game you can play. Hey, this is Major. We've got Parcells and the Cowboys. And Donovan needs me. Well, what about my needs? What about Edie? Will you stop it? All of Philadelphia is counting on me. Well, I can't help myself. I love you, T.O. Then how about you tell me what's buried underneath that pool? Oh, you know I can't tell you that. Then I got a game to play. Terrell, wait. Oh, hell. Team's gonna have to win this one without me. <laughs> oh, my God. Who watches this trash? Sex, lies, betrayal. And that woman is just so desperate. <laughs> I don't know what you should watch. Are you ready for some football? Trish. Hey, Shelton. What are you doing here? Oh, me? I was just taking a long, hot shower. And where are you off to? Looking so pretty. Monday night. Raw. I got a six-man tag match. William and Eugene need me. What, what about my needs? What about Trish? Oh, sugar. Don't worry. You'll find somebody else. I mean, 
You are the biggest slut on Raw. <laughs> You're so uptight. You need to loosen up. And I know just how. What the hell is going on here? It's a woman in a towel. I mean, this is unconscionable. This, this is scandalous. I, I can see the, the moral fabric of, of America disintegrating right before my very eyes. The sexual overtones are the racial overtones. Excuse me? Oh, Sheldon, you, you may not realize this, but you're an African-American. And everybody knows that African-Americans are attracted to Canadian white women with broken noses. Now, I'm sorry, but the FCC is not going to tolerate this, and neither will I. I mean, I'm not going to have a locker room full of miscreants and deviants. This is the WWE. This is not the NFL. And it damn sure is not the NBA. Because it's this kind of sexual titillation that will send you and other professional wrestlers up into the stands to, to attack the audience. And if that were to happen, that would be the downfall of civilization as we know it. You know what? You really need to lighten up. I have a board of directors to answer to. Someone has to uphold the, the, the virtue of... Is he gone? Yep. <laughs> For some wrestling? ESPN welcomes you to the following presentation of the National Football League. The spotlight's on, time to stake your claim for Monday Night Football's Hall of Fame. From he did what to watch him Barry go. They all turn it up when they play in this show. The Lions, the Packers, the what a football game this could turn out to be! Let's go. Tell me if you're ready for a party. Let me hear it if you want to win. You know it's time to ball. We about to kick it off. Let all y'all let the games begin. Oh yeah! Detroit, get ready. Green Bay, get ready. Are you ready for some football? Well, a Monday night. Back in Lambeau Field, the tundra not yet frozen, but it's getting closer. 35 degrees as we approach kickoff. In this important game in the NFC North, Jim Caldwell, Wisconsin native from Beloit, back at his home state with his 3-4 and four Lions taking on the 4-3 and three Packers, and they're all looking up at the Minnesota Vikings leading this division at 6-2. 38-yard try, the punter Justin Bogle is the holder, and the kick is deflected, and no good. Great call by you, Sean. The battery, the snap, the hold, didn't give Crosby a chance. More than eight minutes with the ball, no points. 14 plays for the Packers. Georgia back in 2009 his completion percentage down about five percentage points from a year ago still averaging better than 264 yards per game the problems the on the play mentioned injuries up front they've been without Taylor Decker they're starting left tackle all year his replacement Greg Robinson injured so Brian Mahalik starts for the second straight game the backs and receivers Golden Tate's had at least 90 catches each of the previous three seasons, one of only four wide receivers in the league to do that. Out of the pistol, and they swing it out to Golden Tate. 
Best in the league at run after the catch over the last four years as well. And he skips into Green Bay territory to the 45 with a gain of 15. You got to keep an eye on Golden Tate. He's caught more better. This has to be an emotional night for him. But general manager Bob Quinn invested a lot of money and resources in the offensive line. And Rick Wagner at right tackle, T.J. Lang at right guard. High price free agents have to pick it up. Lang, the right guard, eight years as a Green Bay Packer. Second and five, Stafford going to the end zone, and it is caught for a touchdown by Marvin Jones. That's the first opening possession touchdown for the Lions this season, and that's touchdown number 200. And he's the fourth youngest man to hit 200, but I just love the way Matt Stafford and the Lions came off the bus ready to play. He sees the rotation to the middle of the field, looks off the free safety, and he shreds Devon House. Great throw and catch by Marvin Jones. And Marvin Jones has become a very good deep ball receiver for the Lions, Sean. And the Packer fans are familiar with that. Last year in the game between the two teams here, Marvin Jones had six catches for 205 yards. And it was the penalty on Mike Daniels on third down and 13 that made it all possible. Would have been a three and out. So here's Matt Prater to add the extra point. And it is good. History-making touchdown pass thrown by Matthew Stafford, the 200th of his career. We asked him about that last night. He said, oh, I didn't know I was on the verge of 200. It's at Lambeau Field. Can Nick Perry, number 53, find out where Cleary's at? Mahalik out of Boston College, replaced by a fellow BC Eagle in Cleary. They've had a great tradition of producing offensive linemen at BC. And a catch out of bounds. No, Golden Tate ruled inbounds, pardon me, on the far sideline. And it's a first down for Detroit at the 44-yard line with a 17-yard gain. That's a great call. Run a sprint out away from Cleary, and I believe Tate got two feet in. Detroit is going to push the envelope here. Tremendous footwork on the catch. Yeah. There's Fells, a dual threat tight end, showing the ability to run after the catch. Devon House finally made the tackle, but they're back in Packer territory with a first down at the 47-yard line. That's good play calling. Run a sprint out pass away from Cleary and then run a quick pass against Devon House. Play clock at one, a Green Bay blitz, and it's on target for a first down. Golden Tate with the catch and his customary run after the catch to the 25-yard line. And you can run after the catch if you get pinpoint accuracy Throws like the nice cold in the red zone we mentioned on the pregame. 0 for 5 last week against the Pittsburgh Steelers in their narrow loss. 45% touchdown percentage in the red zone this year. That's 27th in the league. They've got to detail their work. All these statistics tell part of the story. They have not detailed their work. They've had communication breakdowns. They've had penalties, drop passes. They've got to finish a drive and make this a two-score game. Play clock at one, 12th play of the drive. Abdullah running room as he turns the left corner, goes out of bounds inside the 10, and they're going to give him the four-yard line. Green Bay Packer down out there on the field. That gives Jim Bob Cooter. 3.02 to go in the half. The Lions leading 7 to nothing, And they're just inside the five-yard line. On second down, they can get a first down near the two. Packers crowd the line. Outside running room for Abdullah. That was way too easy. Touchdown, Detroit. That's a great call by Jim Bob Cooter. Almost like he knew what Don Capers was calling. It's an all-out blitz. They come right up the middle. And they have the perfect play call. Here comes the blitz up the middle. Toss the ball to the outside. Good block by Abergaris. And there's Rick Wagner on the edge. 
And Amir Abdullah is going to make you miss in a one-on-one -on -one situation most of the time. Well, that was so easy. Wagner didn't have to block anybody. <laughs> that was an excellent call, and that's how you do it in the red zone. Detail your work. Do your job. Great work by Detroit. Matt Prater makes it 14 to nothing, Lions. Looking for just their second win at Green Bay in 26 years. Stafford knew it from the beginning. Touchdown drives of 71 and 91 for the Lions. Sam Martin's kickoff, returnable for Trevor Davis from the six. Wow. Ooh, he got stood up. Kill and stopped in his tracks at the 15-yard line. Miles Killebrew. At least twice each season since 1930. Tonight here at Lambeau Field, the Lions lead 14 to 3 at halftime. Matthew Stafford, 12 out of 14 for 137. Decent completion percentage for Brett Hundley, but just 80 yards. They continue to throw very short passes with great regularity. Theo Riddick back on the field on the right hip of Matthew Stafford. Wide open, crossing the middle. Golden Tate, first down. Blake Martinez, the tackle, but Tate wow. is to the 45-yard line of the Packers with a 21-yard completion. How do you get Golden Tate against Blake Martinez? Golden Tate in the slot. Leads the NFL in receptions with 35 from the slot. He's very good. He's reliable. He can read coverages. He's a good blocker. He's obviously very the Lions don't call plays. They call formations. They use a dummy snap count and let Stafford decide what the play will be. Wayne Washington is the running back. He's played sparingly tonight, usually in there in short yardage situations. Big bubble in the middle of the field as the Packers rush five and the throw is on target. Golden Tate, another first down. Stafford used the dummy count. He used Tate in motion. He knew it was too deep and man-to-man. -man. They, unlike the Packers, have a veteran center. Don Yulebach in his 14th year with the perfect snap. And the kick right down the middle from Prater. It's back to a two-touchdown lead for Detroit. 9.06 to go, third quarter, Monday Night Football from Lambeau Field. A player, will it be no snap, no play? I think they have something dialed up. From the pistol. Is it time for another one of those zone read runs that they talked about? They're crowding the line. It's the trickery on the flip to Randall Cobb, and he's dumped. Behind the line of scrimmage by Glover Quinn, the veteran safety. And the Lions take over on downs in Packer territory. They run a jet sweep, and Glover came over <laughs> for a beautiful stop. They were about to go down by three scores with Detroit in field goal range. Brett Hundley. They bring extra rushers. He throws a deep one in single coverage. Jordy Nelson. Crowd can't believe there's not a flag against Darius Slay. Looked like he had his arms around the waist of Nelson for a while. Darius Slay. Every week he gets your best receiver in one-on-one -on -one coverage. No call by the referee. I think it's a good call. Slay. Told us I got more confidence, more courage, and I have more fun playing in any corner in football. One of these days, he'll be recognized as a pro bowler. He'd get my vote. So now it's third down and seven. I'm giving this young quarterback a lot of looks, and he had a tough go of it again tonight. That one just a jump ball for Jordy Nelson. 
Slay again in coverage. That's big play, Slay. He came in here with three interceptions, and he welcomes all the best receivers. Saw him last week against Antonio Brown. I've seen him against Odell Beckham, and that's back-to-back -back pretty good plays against Jordy Nelson, the ex-Mississippi State Bulldog. Look at that passer rating. To Iowa, and was a four-year starter at defensive back. Very well respected throughout the NFL and back in his hometown. The middle school gymnasium in Beloit is named after Jim Caldwell, the James Caldwell Gymnasium. There they come. And they get nowhere near Stafford again. Doesn't matter how many they are rushing, they can't get pressure on. There is a flag down on the catch. Was he interfered with or did Marvin Jones perhaps push off? <laughs> I don't know, but that was another great throw by Stafford. He saw the blitz all the way, and I think King put his hands Still in Jones' use face. Of hands, hands to the face, defense number 20. The penalty's declined. Yardage gains is the first down. Take a look at King. He's going to get his hands up in the face. That's a good call. But watch the throw by Matt Stafford on third and 10. Oh, man. The difference in this game. You have a better veteran quarterback that is shredding a defense on third down and a rook or a first year second game starter in Brett Hundley who has struggled on third down. As you said that is Detroit's clear advantage in this division right now. They have the established veteran, outstanding quarterback. And Matthew Stafford. Give Case Keenum credit. He has done a very nice job standing in for. Sam Bradford. All Hundley can do is watch in the final minute of the third quarter. Well, Stafford is the highest paid quarterback in all of football. Highest paid player. Highest paid player in all of football, and you're paying Stafford to come to Lambeau Field and win games just like this. They're 0-3 in the second quarter of the season. A win tonight puts them right back in circulation. If they win tonight, they'd be 4-4, four and four, as would be the Packers, and these two teams would both be two games behind the Minnesota Vikings at the halfway point of the regular season. On second and eight, another first down, first and goal, Detroit. T.J. Jones to the two-yard line. Well, he's in a trip formation. He sees the matchup. He hand signals the route combination, and it's another first and goal. That's how you get it done in the red zone. Make the corrections and get it done. Game. Yep. A couple plays later, Pittsburgh scores on a 97-yard touchdown pass to Juju. Yes. <laughs> Juju Schuster. But, you know, Smith -Schuster. They, they make all these yards in Detroit. I mean, they got banners for yardage in Detroit. But when it comes to making the one yard that they need on a goal line or short yardage, it's unthinkable how hard it is. Raiders one for two tonight. And that one's good from 19 yards. <laughs> Shake of the head from Jim Caldwell. Much more stressful than it should be down there near the goal line for Detroit. Dula has fumbled twice. They have no confidence in their running game. Yeah, hard to protect the lead when you can't run it. With consistency, again. there's a blitz and a screen. Great call against the screen. Theo Riddick. Theo Riddick inside the 20 and finally taken down inside the 15-yard line by Devon House. Another great call. They shred the blitz. It's an all-out zero blitz. And they have a screen called where Riddick bluffs the blitz and crosses the formation like Martinez. Fooled by Riddick. What a call. 63-yard game. Jim Bob Cooter, he's taken some heat recently in Detroit with the struggles of the offense. Young offensive coordinator, just 33 years old. They're back in the red zone. Can they punch it in this time? Riddick tripped up. Lunged forward for a gain of about a yard. Kevin King came flying up to knock him down. Going to use all the clock, and boy, you'd love to be able to run the ball. 
Jim Caldwell has chosen to sit Amir Abdullah, who has fumbled twice, once in the red zone, once on the goal line. I expect to see another run here. And then I think they'll turn Stafford loose on third down. Stafford to the end zone and caught by Marvin Jones. Touchdown, Detroit. That's quite a throw and catch. They faked the quick screen, which they threw earlier in the game to Golden Tate. Marvin Jones acts like he's blocking and takes off. They're going to fake the quick screen to Golden Tate and throw a fly to Marvin Jones for his second touchdown tonight. And Matt Stafford, offensive coordinator Jim Bob Cooter, have solved their problems against the Blitz tonight. 75 yards in four plays. Of course, the big play, the 63-yard screen to Theo Riddick. And that took the crowd back out of it just as quickly as they got into it. 329 yards passing for Stafford tonight on 23 out of 29. Two touchdowns, no interceptions. And Matt Prater adds the extra point. 27-10, Lions, 8.06 to go. Monday Night Football from Green Bay. Offense. Green 18. Green 18. Look out, blitz right up the middle, and he could not escape. Swung down by the safety, Tavon Wilson. The ex-New England Patriot is an excellent box safety. He's going to blitz. Montgomery had to pick up Quandre Diggs, and Hundley missed the hot receiver. Hundley in retreat. Running out of real estate, gets rid of it to Jordy Nelson. And now I think Green Bay has a chance to huddle, but only at UCLA, Sean. There were times he just held the ball way too many times. Over five, six seconds, and he led the country in sacks. And at times tonight, he's held the ball too long and looked uncomfortable. He's got to play faster. Experience will help him, but... He's proven he can play outside the pocket. He's athletic, but he still has a ways to go in the pocket, in this offense, with all these receivers. And Mike McCarthy knows that. Four down territory. Like to get at least half of it back and give yourself a manageable fourth down. Hundley again held on to it for a long time. Richard Rodgers taken down in the open field by Jared Davis. There's a player. Jared Davis, a rookie. Linebacker out of Florida. He's hard on himself. He wants to play perfectly. He's had some problems in coverage, but not that time. I don't think he'll improve in pass coverage, but he's been a great run stopper. Tends to bite on the play action fakes a bit too often. Desperation time for the Packers now, and that fourth down pass is incomplete. Broken up by D.J. Hayden. Veteran the number entering tonight. 1-24 and 24 on the road against the Packers since 92. The worst record ever for any NFL team against any other NFL team in any 25-game span in NFL history. I used to hear that when I was coaching in Tampa. We were 0-57 in games played below 40. 0-58. The only way you end those streaks is by doing what Detroit <laughs> did tonight. Come on the road and get it done. And now they're 1-0. They have a new streak started. And I, I give them a lot of credit. They had a three-game losing streak. They lost a very heartbreaking game at home to the Steelers, and they responded. Credit to the Lions. Oh, boy. Green Bay blitz over the middle. Caught Golden Tate. Taken down inside the five-yard line by Devon House. What you are seeing is a clinic tonight. There's the grinder, Golden Tate. 
I might have let the cat out of the bag, but it's like a video game, Pac-Man. He just gobbles up yardage after the catch, and those pinpoint throws make it accessible. It's another all-out blitz. Stafford knew it. Batted down in return for touchdowns against the Saints. I'm a little surprised they're even throwing the ball, but here is Prater. And between Matt Stafford and Matt Prater, he might be looking at the two most important Detroit Lions mm -hmm. heading in the second half of the season. You know, it is unusual, all the batted balls. He had had 15 passes knocked down or deflected the line this year, most in the league. And he said he thought a lot of that was in one game against New Orleans, but it is a bit of a surprise. It really hasn't been a problem for him in the past. No, but when you're one-dimensional and it's, you're in predictable passing situations and your line is struggling, you're throwing a lot of quick passes, you're vulnerable to getting balls batted down. And what a performance other than the batted ball. Prater two for three. His only miss was from 55 and it hit the crossbar. This is from 31 and it is good. He recently signed a contract extension with the Lions through 2020. That we saw a year ago. So the Lions win in Green Bay. Words that have hardly been spoken over the last quarter century. Final score 30 to 17. Stay tuned for the GMC postgame on Sports Center coming up next. We'll see you next Monday night from Charlotte. So the game is over. All right, coming up next on Sports Center, Heisman candidate Baker Mayfield joins the show. Why he enjoys so much playing the role of the heel in college football. MVP candidate Aaron Judge in studio for a special announcement. And why the homer he hit against my Orioles was the best contact he had all season long. And an excerpt from tomorrow's highly anticipated 30 for 30 on the Nature Boy. Sports Center, right after this. ESPN thanks you for watching this presentation of the National Football League. We always look forward as well to welcoming uh, Lewis Riddick Sundays and Mondays. And as we're watching this game, you and I are having a conversation. And the, the Cliffs notes are, hey, if you're Detroit, this is what you're supposed to do. Go on mm -hmm. the road and, and handle a, a, a somewhat inferior opponent without Rodgers. And you corrected me a little bit. Explain the, sort of the context of, of how you view Green Bay. Well, I still think, obviously, there's enough playmakers on this football team to where they should not be totally inept and, and wind up getting blown out at home mm -hmm. on a Monday night in a primetime game like this. Okay, so they're not – they've lost Aaron Rodgers, who undoubtedly right now has proven to be maybe the MVP of the National Football League because of how his team is kind of like absence, almost right. packed it in, it looks like. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to say they're not competing, Scott. That's not what I mean, but it's the effect that, they, that it has on their psyche and their competitiveness. So I think this is still a quality win for Detroit that does, has not had success at Green Bay. And right now, every game to them means something very, very important as they try to chase down Minnesota. So it's a quality win no matter how you look at it. I don't care who was at quarterback. Understood. And we will get to uh, the, the division and their sort of chase of the Vikings. It's favorable. But first of all, what Stafford did tonight in a game where the Lions don't punt, this, yeah. what did he show tonight that is an example of what he can do that maybe very few in the league, I think, can well, I think, well, number one, he's showing that $27 million a year is not that much <laughs> money when you're talking about a guy who right now can actually put a full franchise on his back and go ahead and make the kind of pinpoint throws that he's making. Mm -hmm. And the kind of stuff he's doing when receivers are covered, some of the 50-50 <coughs> type of balls where, you know, his, his guys are open, but he only has a very small window with which to fit some of these throws in here. That's perfect. I mean, that's very hard to do over and over and over again when you know that your running game is such that it's very inconsistent. It's very sporadic. And guys, you know, like Amir Abdullah are fumbling the ball in crucial situations. You know, you're going to have to be the one who has to make the plays, especially down in the red area where they've struggled. Tonight he answered that call. And again, for anybody who thought, thought that Matthew wasn't worth $27 million a year when he got his contract extension, you're seeing why the Detroit Lions paid him the money that they did. It would be pointless to look backwards because there's not a thing in the world that the Lions can do about some of the close losses that they have. But if we look forward at mm. who they have to play and we lay it side by side alongside Minnesota, I think there's a, a path for the Lions that's pretty, that's pretty favorable and the guy that they've got playing quarterback compared to who everybody else in the division has. Yeah, Coach Gruden mentioned it during the broadcast, the fact that, look, the fact that they have Matthew Stafford and uh -huh. the rest of the teams in this division right now are having – Average to sub to sub average play at the quarterback position puts them in the driver's seat without a doubt. Minnesota plays for the next five on the road. 
and they have some heavy hitters that they have to go up against, some teams that can put up some points and will put a lot of pressure on guys like Case Keenum to go ahead and deliver. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is going to be this is going to be an interesting situation for Minnesota because the two-game lead, you know, most times makes you feel a little bit comfortable, especially with the defense that they have. But Matthew Stafford is not to be messed with. And you see when they get rolling – Detroit's very opportunistic on defense, too. They're one of the top teams in the league in terms of turnover differential. They mm -hmm. will turn the ball over and give him short fields to work with. That's a recipe for getting into the playoffs. Even though you're already at the halfway point, you're still two games behind. If you ask, if you ask Stafford, he's too good to tell you the truth. But, but you, as a player, as a guy yeah. in the front office, you have to be looking at chunks of your schedule, looking at the next month if you're Detroit, yeah. and looking at who you play and where you play them, and who Minnesota plays and where they play them, and thinking, all right, we have a chance by, say, Thanksgiving, the traditional Thanksgiving game, to be in a good spot. That has to be happening for Detroit, uh, they, doesn't they, it? Hey, Sitting in those front offices back in the day, Scott, that's what we always used to do. We used to always sit up there and play what if. I think we can get this one. If we can get that one, they'll lose that right. one and get this one. Look, players don't do that. Well, you know, players talk about it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But in the front office, that's exactly what you're doing. You're trying to see what is the path for you to go ahead and get into the postseason. And right now, I, I think their sets up for them. And that two-game lead with, against the Minnesota defense, I know some people will go, there's no way. There's no way they'll be able to make up that ground. I think they're going to. I think there's only going to be one representative from the North in yep. the playoffs. And they already beat Minnesota in Minnesota. They get them at home. And, uh, look, time will tell over the course of the next coming weeks and months what happens. We get back now to uh, Lambeau, the GMC postgame report. It's Susie Colbert. Susie. Hi, Scott. Welcome back to Lambeau on a cold night, about 30 degrees, even colder for fans. When the Packers lose, but win or lose, the Wisconsin band plays. And we're staying warm because... We've been dancing. <laughs> Andy uh, true and story. Matt. True story. Yeah. No, the atmosphere is great here. Yes, and it is. It's unfortunately, cool. Brett Hundley now 0-2 in replace of Aaron Rodgers. But the Lions exercised a ton of demons here tonight, so we could run through a bunch of them. But let's start with it. It had been a long time, 17 possessions, since they had scored a touchdown. You were chatting with Marvin Jones before the game. So let's start there with Stafford to Marvin Jones. Well, I was just talking to Marvin Jones, talking before the game about how he needed to get up and make these plays. And he told me before the game that they were going to go deep, they were going to go early, and they were going to go often. Right here, you're looking at Matt Stafford looking off the safety, as Matt alluded to in the first half. But the thing that really stood out to me was Marvin Jones being able to own all the cornerbacks all night. This second touchdown right here, Susie, was so pretty. Another great play. Showed that he wanted it more than the DB wanted it. Marvin Jones, heck of a night, man. He showed up big Monday night. That's when you want to perform. Big stage Monday night and, and at really Lambeau great Field. Coverage. It's really great coverage on both those. I mean, just well executed by quarterback and wide receiver. I don't know much what the defense could do much better than that. Detroit was just on in those two plays. Yeah, and, and there was actually some mossing going on, too. There was. I'm going to tell you what. When you look at the, the offense of, of the Detroit Lions, you know, of course it's going to start with Matthew Stafford, but I have to give, you know, kudos and my hats off to Jim Bob Cooter and them for being able to come in here put an offensive game plan together. And like you said, Marvin Jones, heck of a night. You talk about Moss and Susie, that second touchdown will be on You Got Moss next week. They got the running game going too. They hadn't scored a rushing touchdown since week five. They'd only scored two on the season. That's a big help. Well, advantageous runs. And ironically, the runs worked in part because of Dom Capers' aggressive blitz calling. And sometimes when your star quarterback's out, maybe as a defensive coordinator, you feel like, man, I gotta do more. I gotta, I gotta create some offense on defense. I gotta bring some blitzes that I otherwise wouldn't be blitzing if our starter was in there. And you saw that tonight, I think, just a little bit. In Detroit, and Jim Bob Cooter seemed to have the right play call on at the right time. Here you have the screen when they bring an all-out blitz. Huge play late in the game. Earlier on the running touchdown that we alluded to, there was a blitz at that time as well. Here's another blitz. Golden Tate beats his man inside inside leverage, gets the gets the runaway, gets right inside to the inside the five yard line. So, really, I think Matthew Stafford, this Detroit Lions uh, receiving game, their running game, they were ready. They made sideline adjustments and they were ready for the blitzes of the Green Bay Packers all night. Yeah, you know, Stafford talked about. Of course, he keeps a notebook on all the defensive coordinators he faced. All the he talked great about, ones yeah, How many pages, how many times they had met. And, and Susie, the thing about Dom Capers, having played him a bunch of times, you never know really what you're getting, uh, before, you know, the week leading up to it. Once the game starts, you know what you're gonna get. So what's the takeaway from Brett Hundley? 
There's some good. I mean, I think, Randy, I think we talked, there's some good about Brett Hundley, but it's just kind of conservative. There's nothing explosive down the field that they're hitting. You know, he had a, he had a few good plays. He had some good tempo there in the, in the no huddle before the half, the no, no huddle at the end. But really, it's just not enough. This is called title town. They expect titles, not like, hey, we're going to score 14 points and hope for the best. What is, what do you talk, you call it a title town? This, this city, this town has been spoiled but for a very good reason. When you look at the play of Hundley, I, I've seen some good points tonight, but I think it's, it, it's, it's right, moving in the right direction for them to put him in that no huddle situation to move the ball, to get him in the rhythm. Because if you look at when they huddled up, he didn't do too good. But when they let him play, Susie, let him run up and down that uh, football field, he made plays and he got comfortable. When Aaron Rodgers got hurt, we talked about this division kind of being a snow globe that just got shook up. <laughs> we didn't know where it was going to land. That snow has started to fall, started to settle. It's kind of it's pretty clear. It's, it's a two-team race in this division right now. You know, I mentioned that the Lions exercised some demons. The last time they had a double-digit win at Lambeau Field, 1982. Oh. It's rare for the Lions to come away with a win here. And uh, wait, wait, wait. Is that Lynn um, Dickey in 82? No, is I don't. That 85? We're, um, yeah, we're, we're actually waiting for Matt Stafford, who I see is. <laughs> who he is coming down the here, field. Man. So, so let's just keep it going until he gets here, guys. Because he admitted he is one in five coming in here. This is a tough place to play. It's That's funny that you say that, though. He says it's one in five, because, but I just love coming here. It's one of my favorite places to come play. And as a quarterback, you know, similarly, it probably didn't have a great record here either, but it is one of the great environments. It feels like a college atmosphere, even though it's the pros. It's pretty awesome. Here he is. You're, you're, uh, he's so good. He, Boy, he's give me some of them hands. Give me some of them hands. <laughs> So, Matt, congratulations, first Thank of you. all. Thank sure. We were just talking about how you had said, you just love coming here. This is a tough place to play, but what is it about Lambo? I love it. You know, it's, it is a tough place to play. They've got great fans. Um, it's loud just like it is right now, but uh, I don't know. There's a bunch of history here that, uh, that I love. You feel it when you walk in here, and, uh, you know, it's just an honor to play here. I love, I love playing these guys. It had taken a little time for you guys to get back on track. We mentioned it had been a number of possessions since you had scored a touchdown. What felt right tonight? Um, you know, I think we didn't execute perfectly. You know, we, we had some trips down the red zone I wish we would have scored on, but, uh, you know, we did a nice job, um, night, you know, day in and day out, night in and night out here, just throwing it in and uh, making some good plays. I want to ask you about the blitzes that they brought tonight, particularly third down. How'd you prepare for that? How were you so successful? Um, you know, I've, I've gone against these guys for a lot of years now and, and played against Dom Capers' defenses for quite some time. So, um, you know, it wasn't perfect. Um, we had some that, you know, got home a little bit, but uh, the guys up front did a great job. Our backs did a great job of scanning around and picking up the, uh, you know, secondary blitzers, and we were aggressive against it. You know, point of emphasis, um, it looked like third down, y'all stood out tonight, very efficient. Uh, last week going against Pittsburgh, not too good on third down. Take me through your 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 week of preparation. Was that, was that a big point of emphasis to do better on third down? Absolutely. Um, you keep drives alive in this league and you get points. And, uh, you know, we uh, we didn't do a good enough job last week. We executed a little bit better this week and, uh, you know, put some points up. Tell us about Marvin Jones. Oh, he's great, man. Uh, had some big plays tonight. Um, guy works extremely hard, makes some big-time plays. Yeah, I mean, we had... About every different kind of throw you could go. We had the go ball over the top, the back shoulder, the jump ball in the end zone. A couple in rounds, man, he played great. Matt, yesterday when we talked, I had asked you about the meaning of getting your 200th career touchdown before the age of 30. And we all laughed about that. You didn't even know it was happening. So now that you've done it, what does it mean to you? Uh, it means a lot. You know, anytime um, you can be mentioned with some of the great names in this game uh, for doing something, uh, you know, it's an honor. It's a lot of fun. I work extremely hard, just like everybody else on our team, to, to try and uh, help our team win. And those, those records are, are part of it. They come with it. I'm just happy to, uh, to be a part of it. Yeah, here are those names. Dan Marino, Peyton Manning, and Brett Favre. Mm. That's some good ones. That's not bad. <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <Absolutely. laughs> Thank you. What about the defense tonight, too? Because it seemed like everything came together. Yeah, no question. We played a complete game for probably the first time all year. Our defense has had some outstanding games. Um, you know, early in the season played extremely well. They were getting turnovers, and our guys tonight shut them down. I mean, uh, that's a tough offense. I don't care who's at the helm. They've got great players. And, uh, you know, really gave up 10 points, gave up a, you know, a late seven there, but uh, did a great job. Big fourth down stop, got us the ball back, kept the momentum for us, so it was nice. 
Good job, man. Appreciate it. Father of twins, Susie. Yes. Doing it with twins. Good job, bro. Thank you. Matt, congratulations. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you very yeah, much. A rare win for the Lions at Lambeau wow. Field. So a lot of demons exercised here tonight as he hooks up with Marvin Jones. Two times tonight, the Lions snap a three-game losing streak, get back to four and four, and back in the thick of the NFC North race. The Post Game Report is brought to you by those that live like a pro. GMC. It's that man's cold out here. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Especially when you didn't get a chance to warm up before the game. So you see the final score here, 30-17. to 17. Matthew Stafford, extremely efficient. 26 for 33, 361 yards and two touchdowns, which leads us to our very first discussion as it pertains to Monday Night Football because you talked about it. Matthew Stafford, highest paid quarterback in all the National Football League, went out there and, and you could hang laundry on some of those throws. They were absolutely Fantastic. frozen ropes, DC. And it, it wasn't like they were wide open. Yeah. I mean, there's guys covered. And he's making throws on the run, back shoulder throws, the one I referenced earlier. You just mm -hmm. don't do that. I mean, you can practice it, but that's God-given ability and yeah. talent that this guy has. And you see why he's the highest paid quarterback in the oh, yeah. player. So, I mean, it's just... What he can do with his arm can transcend, just like Aaron Rodgers, who was right. watching the game. Sure. He can transcend an offense. That Stafford did that tonight for the Lions. Reggie, as a wide receiver, when you know that your quarterback is really locked in, how much easier does that make your job as a wide receiver? Oh, all you have to do is show up. Okay. Come ready to play. I mean, as, as DC said, he's throwing lasers. Yes. All you got to do is bring your hands to the party. <laughs> Okay. It's got, yeah. Them balls got Velcros on them. It's sticking to their chest. Right. Okay, so same question, but it's going to be a different answer for you, Ike. When you see a quarterback that's locked in, how much harder does that make your job in the secondary? Man, you know, right now, he's chefing right now. You know how the chef just be cutting stop. that turkey. Hibachi style. Yeah, he's okay. he cutting that you. turkey right now. It, 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 it just like brings me back. Putting that salt on there. I got you. I got you. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. bringing me back to the Pittsburgh Steelers game. Okay. Like he was chefing in the turkey holes, as, as, yeah. as Coach would say. Yeah. Just dropping them on a dime. DC already said it, throwing lasers. It's hard for a defender. And Aaron Rodgers plays the same way. He got that kind of arm. He's mm -hmm. very accurate. It's on orthodox and you see why the man got paid because I'm not saying he's doing a lot with little yeah. his receivers are pretty good yeah. especially when it, when you want to talk about Pro Bowl receivers and Golden Tate uh, Marvin Jones is really stepping this That's game right. up at the same time but just the way he's the location of his balls you know it, it's the difference between getting picked off and actually throwing <laughs> a good pass I like it Stop it. <laughs> Let's the spin around the table because the Lions and the Packers Stop clearly it. two teams on two oh, different trajectories right now. Of course, the loss knocks Green Bay down a peg. They're 4-4, four and four, and the Lions also 4-4. Four four. So looking at, looking at these teams right. here, right. guys, the Detroit Lions, are, are they a playoff team right about now, Reggie Wayne? What say you? I'm telling you, man, as I said before, right when I start drinking the Kool-Aid, there's no sugar in there. <laughs> it's, it, it's just Blender. not the same. It's bland. That aftertaste. Yeah. It's just bland. Okay. That's when you, you taste it. No, salt on no, no, yeah. not, not, no yeah. sugar, no nothing. You know what I mean? So it's like when you take a, uh, take a sip, mm -hmm. you're like, something's missing. Okay. And that run game is just not giving me enough for, to yeah. make me believe that this team is a playoff So it's, it's, team. it's not yeah. the, the Kool-Aid from House Party where he's sitting oh, no, there. No, 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 oh, okay, no, okay. No, Detroit no, Lions, David, the playoff team know, right man. now. I'm, I'm kind of with Reggie because early in the season we saw a little bit of a run game right. show up. You know, and they hit a screen. Um, they had some plays from the backs, but it wasn't like we talked about where we're going to rely on the run game and a good defense to kind of get us out of this. They played against – a Packers team that doesn't have the guy right. that we all right. wanted to see out there, right? right. Brett's going to do what he, think, what, he, what he can do, but it's not the Packers with Aaron Rodgers. So I don't know how good their defense is. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if they can really go out there and shut down a, a, a good offense, right. a, a solid, consistent offense, and then go back and match them on the other side of the ball, or does Matt Stafford have to play above the X's and O's like he did tonight? Now, if he does that every week, right. they got a chance, I'm okay. sure. You can't defend that stuff, but... It's just too hard to be that consistently throwing dimes out there. I mean, it's a beautiful night in Green Bay. Yeah. The weather's going to become more, more of a factor as the, the season grows on. The playoffs are going to come into factor, and every team that's ever had any kind of success is able to run the football and play good defense. And those are the only question marks we have with Detroit right now. So mm -hmm. are they really a playoff team? The that's Detroit Lions and the many emotions of Jim Caldwell before we hit the break. Are, you think they're a playoff team, Mike? What do you say? No, it's hard. You know in the playoffs you got to have a running game. Yeah. I, I pretty much think every playoff team that we're going to talk mm -hmm. about 
they have a running back and a running game, especially in the red zone. Okay. Yeah. Well, win, lose, or draw. We do know that Jim Caldwell has the exact same expression on his face no matter what the play <laughs> was. Like and in this one, his team goes out there. They get themselves a win, 30 to 17. Spot. We'll discuss if they're a playoff team or not. But one thing's for sure, if the season ended right now, who would be the best playoff team sitting at the top? Well, it would have to be Carson Wentz mm -hmm. and those Philadelphia Eagles doing some big things in the city where the love is brotherly. We'll discuss on the flip side. Total Access Endgame back after this. says he's out of his fucking mind in case you haven't noticed. The way things are going tonight is going to get a lot worse.
Sims first series, it appeared that Sims would indeed have a big day. Number 20 ran free and easy through the middle of the Cleveland defense. On just the third snap of the ball game, Hipple went deep for Leonard Thompson and found him for 80 yards. With this catch, Thompson equaled his yardage total from six catches the week before, and he made a very big and a very long play look easy against the dejected Brown defense. Another angle of the 80-yard bomb reveals Hipple never looked anywhere else but in Thompson's direction, where he had beaten reserve cornerback Larry Brazil by several strides. Brazil was playing due to an injury to Lawrence Johnson, so it was no coincidence that the Lions came at him on their first pass of the game. To say Brazil was burned would be quite an understatement. Under the watchful eye of William Gay, Cleveland took over for its first offensive series. Right from the start, Seif found himself under pressure from the Lions' front four. Sipes' forward wall did give him some time to pick out a receiver. The Lions secondary came up with a fine defensive play to break up the pass. It looked like a long day for the Browns' offense until their second series, when number 38 Johnny Davis ran into a brick wall, then bounced outside for 16 yards and a first down. With Charles White out for the season, Davis, the former 49er, is Mike Pruitt's partner when Cleveland lines up with two setbacks. Four plays later, Cleveland's line held off the silver rush, and Sipe had time to go up top to number 83, Ricky Feature, for a pretty over-the-shoulder 42-yard touchdown. Another look at the tying touchdown shows Sipe had the time to wait for Feature to come open by a single stride and hit him with a nice spiral. The speed of the receiver position has been a concern of this Cleveland team. They lost their top draft pick, Ron Brown, to the Olympics, and Feature is capable of delivering some much-needed deep speed to a team that badly lacks it. With the score now tied at seven, the Browns' defense surfaced. Despite the success of the Lions' air attack, Hipple kept the ball on the ground, relying on Billy Sims and his new backfield partner, fullback James Jones, number 30, Detroit's first draft pick from the University of Florida. But the Lions' setbacks found little room to run, although the same can't be said for their pass routes. Witness Tom Cousineau's coverage of Sims coming out of the backfield. Billy Sims' frustration was more evident in the second quarter when he couldn't handle Hipple's pitch out for an 11-yard deficit and loss of possession on the fumble. Chip Banks, number 56, was Cleveland's man on the spot with this lion gift. But Sims had lots of company, for through the last half of the first period and almost all of the second, the Lions simply couldn't tie down the football. At Florida, James Jones was known as a glue-fingered receiver. This play gives no evidence of that ability. But everyone wearing silver and blue was having problems. Even when Hipple hit a receiver on the numbers, this one to Mark Nichols, number 86, the ball ended up on the ground. This fumble recovery was negated due to a Cleveland offside. Of the four times Detroit had possession after their opening touchdown pass, three of those series ended in disaster. One on Sims fumbled, two others on interceptions. The first took place when a diving Hanford Dixon, number 29, picked off Hipple's pass over the middle. Cleveland is not a team generally known for producing turnovers, but they were getting them in bushels today. 
Their second interception came from the shotgun when under heavy pressure, Kipple overthrew Jeff Chadwick and put the ball right into the waiting arms of number 40, cornerback Rod Perry. There's a bit of irony here, for Perry was acquired by Detroit in a trade with the Rams, then rejected because of a bad knee. The former All-Pro cornerback certainly looked healthy on this, his first step as a Cleveland Brown, and the 21-yard return that followed. While Detroit was having its troubles, Cleveland's new two tight end offense was clicking smoothly. Although number 81 Harry Holt coughed up the ball, the officials ruled he was down before he lost it. And a 26 yard gain for Cleveland was the result. Holt is a rookie who played in Canada the past two years. The Browns believe the big tight end would have been a first round pick in the NFL draft had he been eligible. Two plays after Holt's catch, Sype dumped the ball to Mike Pruitt in the flat. And the big fullback did the rest, giving Cleveland a 14-7 lead. While Harry Holt is one reason for the Browns' two tight end attack, Mike Pruitt is another. In the lone setback formation, he will shoulder the running load, which should give him a good crack at a fourth 1,000-yard season. With only 35 seconds remaining in the first half, Cleveland's seven-point lead was suddenly and dramatically in danger. Jeff Gossett punted 41 yards to Alvin Hall, who wisely waited for his blocking wedge to form, then streaked right up the middle and down the left sideline for 66 yards before being run out on the Browns' five. Hall's exciting return had put his team back in the game on the brink of a tie. Let's look at the play from punter Gossett's perspective. Hall seemed to get lost in the crowd, then broke out and hurtled Gossett's attempt at the tackle. From there, it was clear sailing until safety Al Gross pushed him out of bounds. damage had been done and once again a member of the special teams had provided a spark where there had been none. For on the very next snap, Kipple rolled right from the five, avoided the rush and found tight end Ulysses Norris for the touchdown that tied the game at 14. Another look at the score shows a good play fake to number 30 fullback Jones who came open in the end zone. But Hipple's sprint out allowed him to spot Norris all alone. And despite being outplayed for most of the half, Detroit went into the locker room even with the Browns. After seeing his defense scored upon for the first time in 1983, Lions defensive coordinator Ed Kayad wanted to make it a bit more uncomfortable for Brian Seip in the second half. A Bill Gay sack, his sixth of the young season, helped force a Cleveland punt. And the Lions offense began its initial possession of the third period in excellent field position. Eric Hippel, following a two-touchdown first half, went right to the air on first down and found Leonard Thompson, number 39. Thompson proved to be Detroit's top receiver against the Browns. And another hookup from Hipple moved the ball to the Cleveland 22-yard line. But the drive stalled when Hipple was tackled for a seven-yard loss by blitzing linebacker Tom Cousineau, number 50. The Lions had to settle for the field goal as they were unable to take full advantage of their fine field position. But Eddie Murray's 43-yard boot did put Detroit ahead 17-14 with five minutes gone in period three. The 
Browns wasted little time in coming back. Beginning with a pitch out from Sipe to Mike Pruitt, number 43, Cleveland marched downfield with relative ease as Sipe cleverly mixed the run with the pass. Completions to tight ends Ozzie Newsom and rookie Harry Holt, number 81, punctuated Sipes' effective use of the short passing game and allowed the Cleveland quarterback to confuse the Lions' defense by calling a draw play. Two plays after Pruitt's 13-yard burst, Sipes confounded the Lions even more, and the result was a touchdown pass to the wide-open Newsom, number 82. Newsom is listed as a tight end, but like Kellen Winslow of the Chargers, he can perform any function as a receiver. His enormous physical skills make him equally valuable as a deep threat and in the control passing game, where his ability to run with the ball can best be utilized, as it was on this 15-yard score. The 14-14 tie at halftime did not last too long. Detroit's field goal gave way to a Browns touchdown. Cleveland had a 21-17 third quarter lead. The Lions needed more offense, and if the signals given by backup quarterback Gary Danielson were any indication, Detroit would be on easy street. That is, if starter Eric Hipple could understand them. Maybe something was lost in the translation. For on Detroit's next possession, Hipple was sacked for a 17-yard loss, and the Lions were forced to punt for only the second time in the game. The Browns took over in Lions territory and had an excellent opportunity to increase their four-point lead. Once again, Sipe used all weapons at his disposal. First running back Mike Pruitt, and then wide receiver Ricky Feature, number 83. But Feature fumbled the catch at the Detroit 11-yard line, and linebacker Ken Fantetti jumped on the ball for the Lions. Detroit had come up with a big defensive play just when it seemed that the Browns might take control. The third quarter had been as hard fought as the first half. And it ended with Cleveland ahead 21 to 17. With Gary Danielson now at quarterback, the Lions also went to the short passing game, and they started moving the ball against Cleveland's questionable secondary. Danielson hit Leonard Thompson for a first down, and then he picked out veteran Freddie Scott in the middle of the field. But Scott, number 87, like his counterpart from Cleveland, could not hold on to the ball after making the reception. And when the bodies were finally sorted out at the Lions' 45-yard line, the officials ruled that the ball belonged to the Browns. Cleveland had been successful against an aggressive Lions defense by balancing its running game and its passing attack. And the Browns continued to do that on their first possession of the final quarter. Mike Pruitt's bullish running set up a sight pass to wide receiver Dave Logan, number 85, which in turn set the stage for another first down run by Pruitt. Pruitt would end the day with 137 yards rushing, and his powerful stabs at the defense undoubtedly wore the Lions down. With the ball at the Detroit 22-yard line, Sipe found Logan in the corner of the end zone for a touchdown, and a 28-17 Cleveland lead. 
Scoring strike to Logan was Sipes' fourth touchdown pass of the game, the seventh time in his NFL career that he has thrown four or more touchdowns in a single game. A second look shows that Sipes made a quick pump fake over the middle to freeze the defense before lofting the perfect pass to Logan. Sipes' seventh touchdown pass of the season increased Cleveland's lead to 11 points with 10 minutes remaining in the game. Detroit now needed to get in the end zone twice in order to win, and the strategy to be employed was the subject of much sideline discussion between the Lions' two quarterbacks, Gary Danielson and Eric Hipple. strategy session was a success. Danielson came out throwing and he found openings in Cleveland's pass coverage. It did not take Danielson long to bring the Lions to the Browns 15 yard line. And from there, the veteran quarterback needed just one more pass to get Detroit right back in the game. The second touchdown reception of the game by Ulysses Norris was a painful one, but it cut Cleveland's lead to 28 to 24 with six minutes left in the contest. The nine play 80 yard drive put the Lions back in it. It was now anybody's game and the swings and momentum were impossible to keep track of. Right now, Detroit was in control and its defense kept it that way. Number 78, Doug English, tackled Sipe in the end zone for a safety, and the Lions now trail by only two, 28 to 26. More importantly, the Lions would get the ball with the opportunity to go ahead, and they wouldn't need a touchdown to do it. With under five minutes remaining, it appeared Detroit was in the driver's seat. But it all came apart on the following possession. Gary Danielson threw behind his intended receiver right into the arms of number 21, Mike Whitwell. And the Brown safety returned the interception to the Detroit 27-yard line. A Matt Barr field goal was the end result, and the Lions now trailing by five needed a touchdown with less than two minutes left in the game. Danielson did not quit. He used the clock well, throwing short passes to wide receiver Leonard Thompson and rookie Jeff Chadwick. But the Browns' defense stiffened and Danielson was pushed to his desperate limit. On fourth and eight from the Cleveland 38-yard line, he threw a perfect pass to Chadwick the rookie could not hold on to the ball. And Lions' hopes for victory ended right there. For Detroit, it was a tough one to lose, particularly in front of the home crowd. And on a day when its quarterbacks threw for over 350 yards and three touchdowns. But the Lions could not contain Brian Seif and Mike Pruitt. And in the end, that proved to be their undoing. The final score from the Pontiac Silverdome, the Cleveland Browns 31, the Detroit Lions 26.